Hey everybody, Mike here with Mike Hart Shop. Today we're working on the Bridgeport mill and I was getting myself back up to speed on all of the functions and things that the mill does and I thought, you know what, I think this is great information to share with you. Uh, just exactly what this machine is capable of, of its automated features and things like that. So let's get into it. When you look at a machine like this, there are knobs and buttons and levers and there's stuff everywhere on this machine. We got them here and here and here and here. And like I said, it can be complicated if you don't know what the machine does. And I haven't used one since the 90s. So I just was taking some time to get myself back up to speed. And I thought, you know what? I think it would be great to just go around this machine and share with you all of its capabilities and maybe share also some of the other things we can bolt on here and what those items can do as well. So first of all, a milling machine is for the purpose of turning, spinning, flattening, um, boring, all that kind of stuff. You put things here on this table, you can go up and down with things, you can go side to side, back and forth, you can turn this head at an angle. There's all kind of stuff it can do. Uh, between this and a couple of lathes like we have here, you can make almost anything. So I thought a good place to start would just be right at the top. Let's start with this thing here and talk about what it does. In order to do that, we need to go down here there are all kinds of different things you can put in here to spin and you can spin either direction the way this is hooked up forward or backwards but in order to make stuff cut uh, for example we have an end mill in here right now um, we're using a specific collet for that and this up here is for tightening down the collet so let me show you how that comes apart and how you get a collet in and out first of all i gotta open this up this is just a vise that you use. We could drop the table down and stuff like that, but I think I'll get enough space here to be able to pull this out. So you take your wrench. Where did I put my wrench? I guess this is the one. Yep, that's the one. And you have a, up here, you have a lock. You push that in order to loosen this. Okay, now we've got our call it loose. So you push the lock and you turn the wrench. Always take the wrench off. You don't want to turn your mill on. I also put my wrench back here as a place to keep it. I keep one there and I have another one stuck right here for the uh, table bolts and stuff. Uh, but once that's loose, take a hammer, a wrench, something, give it a whack. That'll knock this loose because it's a taper fit and you can pull out the collet. And that's how these work. Um, they are a sleeve and then they are a taper and it's threaded up in here and this threaded rod here is what pulls them in and then tightens them down. This one uh, is a different collet than some but this one is the right size for this specific end mill. So we've covered the lock. We haven't covered this yet. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, another thing this machine has and this happens to have a cover on it um, but it has the adjustment here for being able to pivot the motor. Inside of there, there's several different pulleys that the belt can be on. And uh, this is the adjustment for that. On this side, it's just a pivot bolt here, okay? And then on this side, um, you can loosen this up, which I'm not gonna do, to adjust your belt tension or loosen it so you wanna drop your belt down. I'm not gonna take all that apart to show you, but there's three pulleys here and three pulleys here, and you can move that belt um, to change the speeds of the spindle. So the next thing here then is this unit here. And this one I had to scratch my head about for a minute because I never used this back in the day. It's a speed adjustment from high to low range. So let me get you guys back in the tripod and we'll talk about that. So this thing slides like this and like this. And by itself, there's nothing that it does. But in combination with this here, this is at high and the low speed is what it is. So this in combination with this changes speed. So when we spin this, you'll notice how fast this goes. Okay. Wait for that to stop. Don't ever try to change anything with everything spinning. And if we want to change that down to low speed, we do this. Interesting, that also changed the direction. Hmm. You see, that does nothing if I don't have that down here because of the way the gears work. So... these two in combination and it did reverse it 
interesting. I didn't realize it did that. So I may be missing something there, and some of you guys are smarter than me. I never really used the low speed stuff. So uh, for me, it was always just here and here, and that's the way I used it. The next thing we're gonna come to is this, and this is the worm feed. This controls this unit here, which can be tied to this, okay? So you can manually plunge up and down, but let's say we wanna do a very careful plunging to a specific depth on something, then I'm gonna leave this in high speed for now, but this engages the worm in and out. So right now I don't have the drive engaged. When I do, which is this lever down here, this won't move anymore. Um, but we're gonna leave that engaged and uh, leave that disengaged. We'll just turn this on so you can see this spin. So you can see this spin like that, okay? And that's just this thing. It's not engaged to this right now, it's just spinning free. And when we engage the drive itself, here, this will start to go down or up. I'm gonna move this down here so that it's in a safe position so we don't bind anything. You see that lever going down now, okay? So this starts going down because this drive is engaged here. Um, we have a Michitoyo here that doesn't have a battery in it. Well, it does, but it's a dead one. And that's kind of an old school way of doing measurement for depth, um, that kind of stuff. So you can zero that out and decide, you know, how deep you want something to be, uh, that kind of stuff. So then there's a stop here also that you can adjust. I don't remember, but I think this has an auto shut off. So when you achieve the depth, this automatically pops back out. I don't remember. It's been too long, so I'll have to refresh my memory on that. Um, so we've covered our high and low speed adjustment up here, our uh, high and low speed back here. Also, this is uh, has to do with engagement, our brake, um, our adjustment knob. There's a knob over on this side which has to do with speeds for the spindle as well. Uh, I'm still learning that one. It has to do with uh, how fast this thing turns here and there's a very slow the medium and, and a faster one and it's on i think the faster one right now so that's over on this side i think we've covered most of the features of the head itself um, there's a lock here for the spindle as well right here um, that you can lock that down so when you get this so you got to go to a specific depth okay we've measured it we're going to go there then you can crank that down and uh, that will give you the option there to uh little wrench uh, that'll give you the option to uh, lock that thing in place so that it doesn't move anymore and you can do your machining if you're trying to machine a specific slot that's not a pass-through stuff like that uh let's see what else do we want to talk about here uh, i guess we didn't talk about collets a whole lot let's bring some collets over and we'll show you that we only talked about this specific one but there's all kinds of different heads that can go in here so let's lower this table down a little bit and give us some space That should be space for most of what I want to put in there. So I've got some tools over there. And then my basic collets are here. And I'll just grab a random sample of collets. Okay, so there's a random sample. Again, there are these tapers. Oh, i got to get this stuff cleaned up. Um, and they have different specific sizes. And when you tighten them down in there like this, this squeezes these together and grips onto the tool. So you put your collet in here like so. Spin down your thingy bob, okay, and then you get your tool in there if you have one that's that, that you're shooting for for that specific size. And then you put your brake on, put your wrench on that, and you tighten it down so that tool stays in. Uh, you release it, and then you should be good to go. I know this is very basic stuff, but I know it's uh, something that a lot of people have zero exposure to, so I thought it would be good to just explain a few things about this machine. Uh, what else do we have here? Let's see. Oh, we have uh, different cutters, boring bars. Um, this, this is an offset cutter. So if I wanted to um, drill a, a large hole, I can use this uh, cutter in here, put this up in the machine into a collet, and it will give me the opportunity to adjust how big I want this to be so I can cut larger circles in something. Or I can even use it to cut radius. Now, I don't know how far I can go, but I know one project I got to do, I've got to cut some radii. See if that bracket is here. <laughs> okay, this, this is probably not going to be able to be cut with this specific thing because the radius is so big. But if I wanted to cut something that has a radius in it, like this, okay, that was a tighter, I'd be able to use that to a point. Um, I don't know how far, well, I can go out quite a ways with that, but I still don't think it's going to be enough. 
I would need to be out about three inches and that machine, that unit won't do it. So there's other ways to do that. Um, this is an alternator bracket off of a big block Mopar. Uh, I'm going to be making some of these out of aluminum. So uh, that'll be coming at some point. Um, this is 3 uh steel and I'm going to make it out of, I did the math. I did, uh, and to make it out of aluminum needs to be about quarter inch to achieve the same strength as this is. This is a is supported in all areas. It's not a bracket that's out there hanging. So I probably could get away with thinner material. I may try it, but uh, anyway, that's a project that's coming and be making some of those brackets, but that's what that cutter's for. Uh, we also have uh, cutters like this that are for uh, fly cutting, they call it. Um, fly cutting, is that right? Anyway, you can, you can chew stuff out. Okay. I got a bigger one there. Uh, so there's all kinds of different tools. There's a whole bunch more collets over there, a whole bunch more of these uh, cutters like you would use in a lathe for cutting those holes. Um, so lots of things you can do on that. You, like I said, you can also use this for surface cutting as well. So not just for cutting radiuses, but let's say I wanted to surface something. Uh, I believe this one can be used for that to, to, to do, let's say I wanted to do a plate that was four inches wide and I wanted to surface that plate. I could do that in one cut, or of course I could go down and come back and do something wider and wider to make that surface completely flat because that thing would go around and around and around and around and around while this is going this way. So let's talk about the table and what it can do. This table can go back and forth like this, okay? This one's not dr motor driven, so you have to do it manually. Um, but that's part of what I was talking about with surface, you know, machining something, surfacing it. This table goes back and forth. That's what these are for. You'll also notice if you can see the numbers over here, you know you're getting some roll, but I think you can see it. Um, that's called a DRO. It's a digital readout. And it gives me the option to measure, like I need to cut a slot that's 500,000. Okay, so I can do that. I come over here and I zero it. Okay. And then I can go, okay, let's roll that 500,000 this direction. Okay, so there's 500 and a little more than 1,500, 1,000. Um, so that gives me that ability. I also can do that on the Y. So the Y is moving the table in this way and out. Okay, so you saw me do that before. And you can see the numbers are changing over there. So let's do the same thing. I'll set you up and we'll zero this. Zero, and I want to bring 500,000 uh, one direction. I don't know which way I'm going out. So I can machine, 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 machine. Get down close, real careful, real gentle. There we go, 500 thousandths, okay. So let's say I wanted to go 500 this way and 500 that way. Now I've just made a nice little L-shaped, you know, thingy. So we've covered our X and our Y. And then I, you saw me do this before. This adjusts the table up and down here. And yes, you can use this because it does have a dial on it as far as measurements. It doesn't show up on the DRO. Uh, but what I generally do, unless I have to plunge something really stupid deep, is I'll get this close with the table height and then use this with my caliper to know where I need. Oops, I forgot to turn that off. Uh, use this with my table height to release the lock. There we go. To uh, Once the table height in position, let's say I need to plunge a hole 500 thousandths deep uh, down into, let's say I'm doing a piece of inch and I need a, I need a slot cut down in or a hole plunged in 500 thousandths. You can use your Michitoyo here, which is old, old, old school machinist way of doing it. Some people laugh at this and say, you know, oh, it's crude Captain Caveman. For what we do in the shop here, it's more than accurate enough. Throw your battery in there, blah, blah, blah. And then you can adjust that to 500,000. So you can set a stop, all that stuff. So you can get that fairly accurate for what most stuff we're going to do here is. So that's the table up and down. A couple more adjustments. I'm going to get you in the handheld to show you. Got to get this cleaned up some more. It's oil. It's just, yeah, a little surfacey stuff. But you'll see there's a slot right here and then a zero. So right now, this table is actually about three degrees uh, off to the, that way, to the south. Um, so it would be cutting an angled slot like this. So if I had something in here square, okay, and I wanted to cut a perfectly square thing, right now it's not, it's gonna cut at a three degree angle like this, okay? Because this whole head here, 
these all loosen up and will rotate. And that needs to be done. Uh, and in order to rotate that, I think you just do it by hand. I don't think there's a... Oh, is this it? Yeah, I think that's it right there. This is the... I haven't checked that, but I think this is it's either that or this to rotate that head. I can't remember. I'm not sure what that lever's for. Uh, I got to dig into that. But anyway, that's that's the adjustment. I got to recenter that. The other thing you can do is the head itself. Let's say you want to cut a slot at an angle. Okay, so you can angle this head. Okay, this one happens to be set to zero right now. Uh, I'm sorry. This is the this is the side angle here. Zero right now. Okay. That's set to zero right there. So that means that this head is perfectly square to the table, okay? Um, but then the other thing you can do is you can angle this way as well. So if I wanted to cut an angle slot like this on the table, for example, on something I'm working on, then I can tip this head back like this, and that will allow me to make that cut as I move my Y axis in and out uh, on that unit. Um, so that's all of the adjustments. Uh, you can program stuff in here. Um, and I think there's even an alarm, if I remember right. So that when you're machining, it'll go off and let you know. Some of them have that, some don't. Uh, this has forward and reverse. Uh, I think we have this one wired backwards because reverse is forward, forward is reverse. But we know if we change speeds, that also changes it. So a few things probably to learn there yet, but... Uh, let me, uh, oh yeah, there's a lubrication over here for keeping the machine lubricated and a nice little storeroom I haven't cleaned out yet, uh, stuff like that. But I think that's pretty much everything here on all of the things the mill can do. So let me clarify a couple things for you. I am not a machinist. I am not trained as a machinist. I do not know how to do stuff down to, you know, a half a micron, stuff like that. My background, I was an engineering technician when I started out my career in engineering, and I did a lot of prototype building on the mill and the lathe and a few other pieces of equipment that we had. If we had to do high precision work, we had machinists in the model shop that would do that stuff for us. But a lot of the work that I did, both when I worked at uh, Orbital Walbro, uh, Orbital Engine Company, and then when I worked at Mercury Marine, uh, which was a company joint venture called Meteor, Mercury, I can't remember what Meteor st stood for. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was, it was a joint venture between, I worked for Orbital Engine Company and I worked for Walbro Corporation and uh, over the years. And I did a lot of prototype building as an engineer. Uh, I was more of a hands-on type engineer, an applications engineer. And so I did a lot of prototype building. Someday I'll dig around. I've got some of the prototype stuff that I made that was scrapped that didn't quite turn out. Uh, but all that stuff was made like this on a mill and on a lathe. It was all proof of concept stuff. And uh, so I used these machines quite a bit back then. But I'm not in any way claiming that I am a machinist. I'm a guy who can run these machines and machine parts. So there's a difference. I want to be very clear on that. For most of what we do here in the hot rod shop, my skill level is going to be pretty good. I can get things down. You've seen me do stuff on that lathe over there. I can get things down within a thousandth or two. And that's mostly what I need for what I'm doing here. Uh, the machines are capable of way more than that. I'm the one that's the problem. And I know that. So I know my limitations on these machines. I used them for years, even though it's been over 20 years since I used them. That was part of the point of today's episode was just to get back up to speed on all of these things, reassociate, reacquaint myself with the machine. Uh, I'm going to do a little cleanup here and get some of this stuff that's been, it's been really humid. And so everything in the shop has been sweating. Oh, nice. Transmission on the 47 is dumping transmission fluid. Another project. So you're not going to see me turning cranks. I may, on a cheap pair of cylinder heads I don't care about, I may try my luck at surfacing heads. Not so much from the perspective of trying to mill heads, um, but just true the surfaces up a little bit if there's blemishes. I feel like I can fixture that and do that fairly well. That's not really super high, high precision. Uh, so I know my limitations. I'm going to push my boundaries, of course. That's the whole point. Um, another thing I want to clarify. So I've mentioned this before. I know not everybody has a shop this big. I know not everybody has access to machines like this. I don't intend to lose my DIY focus here on the channel. But I did some research, and I found that a machine like this 
you can purchase online a machine that needs to be fixed up like this one did for anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000. The Cincinnati lathe, uh, about the same thing. This one I picked up for 500 bucks. That's probably in the budget of most people. But if it's not, there's more. I was curious what could be purchased in smaller versions online, brand new. And that Harbor Freight has a mill, much smaller version than this for like $800. Um, so that's even closer to being affordable. And for most of the stuff I'm going to be doing, building brackets, um, making even the, I'm going to be making the dual carb blower plate on top of the 671 blower for the golden mullet. That would be doable on a much smaller unit than this. Even most of the blower drive stuff that I'm going to make uh, would be doable on a much less expensive. So if you can buy one of those Harbor Freight units for $900 to $1,500, some of them are two grand, but in that ballpark, um, the chances are they're out there used if you watch and you can get them probably for about half of that price. My point in that is I'm really trying to stay true to the core values of this channel. If a guy had a little cash, he could pick one of the machines up. I'm, I'm really still conscious of not losing sight of what can be done in a shop on a fairly low budget with simple tools. Um, Remember that we cut corners really big time on the projects that we do. I don't want to say cut corners. We do things on the really less expensive side, on the cheap is what I'm saying. So that allows us to do other things. Like when I got the Challenger, I was going to just go to AMD catalog and buy everything it needed to be done. And then I rethought that. I looked at what it was going to cost. I looked at what I figured it was going to cost me to do it DIY. And I realized I could buy all the tools and equipment that I needed to do that car. Um, step up my game in the shop here as far as the fabrication goes and uh, still be money way, way ahead. Plus learn a whole bunch of skills and uh, continue to develop skills uh, through the process, which I enjoy more than swiping my credit card. So again, it's DIY versus BIY. Do it yourself versus buy it yourself. So remember the motto here on the channel this year has been make it safe, make it done, and go have fun. Whoa.